The Department of Psychology at UC Davis is advertising for an assistant professor position in any area of psychology that relates to the research that goes on at the Center for Mind and Brain, and we would love to see some developmental affective neuropsychologists or uh, neurophysiologists apply to these jobs, so please get to our website, check it out, and submit before the deadline. Uh, and secondly, Amanda Geyer and myself are recruiting for a new postdoc in um, developmental affective neuroscience uh, for a study of adolescent depression, and we're especially interested in people who can combine developmental psychology, neuroscience, and quantitative skills into this longitudinal multi-level study, which I will describe briefly. <laughs> I really think I should just retitle my talk, same song, different data. I've been enjoying today. I think there's a lot of uh, coherence across what people are doing. Now let's see if I can figure out how to work this thing. There we go. Um, in talking about adolescent depression, uh, we've been talking a lot about neurobiological factors across multiple levels and uh, stress and social context and experiences that adolescents have. I'm very interested in these topics. Uh, in all of my research, I'm interested in how these things work together. So not just what are the separate contributions of these things, but how are biology and environment working together to impact the development of children's psychosocial characteristics, including depression. And I'm going to describe uh, results from a few studies that look at this uh, and talk about uh, neurobiological processes across brain, endocrine systems, sorry, a little bit more cortisol, and uh, autonomic physiology and environment and social systems across culture, family, and peer groups. So the first one to describe that Amanda Geyer and I are uh, pursuing with our colleagues and students is a study of uh, Mexican origin adolescents recruited out of a larger sample of 700 kids. We're aiming for a final sample of 250, so these are preliminary analyses. And uh, two-thirds of the kids have some symptoms of depression, one-third of the kids don't, uh, for the 250 that we're recruiting out. And for one of the first examinations of the data that we've done at this point, we've been looking at uh, volumetric analyses of the brain uh, from MRI scans and looking at uh, the hippocampus, um, building off a, a paper that came out of Nick Allen's lab a couple of years ago showing that um, in the context of uh, angry family uh, experiences, angry maternal socialization, having a larger hippocampus was uh, a risk factor for increased, the development of increased depression over the transition from early adolescence to later adolescence. We were looking at um, traditional cultural values of Mexican origin families as a potential protective factor involved with that. And what we found was, indeed, left hippocampal volume uh, moderated the association between familism and the children's reports of depressive symptoms, controlling for positive parenting, negative parenting, and ethnic pride uh, from both mother report and from youth report. So uh, really seeming at the specificity to a certain degree of this idea of a, of a protective environment of feeling strongly connected to the family. And interestingly enough, also predicting to rumination. Uh, so a potential cognitive factor that might be involved in building this link between um, family experiences, um, hippocampal volume, and adjustment. Um, in a study building out, and by the way, I really should have a picture of NIH on every single one of my slides. None of these data would exist without the support of intra, uh, NIMH intramural and extramural programs. Um, in this study that was conducted in the intramural program, uh, we looked at adolescent development over two years for a group of youths who were recruited for elevated levels of internalizing or externalizing problems. And uh, in this analysis, we looked at parasympathetic regulation of emotion um, and in interaction with parental socialization. And what we found was that uh, in response to uh, mood induction videos, girls who showed the atypical pattern of parasympathetic suppression to sadness, and this is something that I've been discussing with a couple of other people here, but there's, there's data showing that typically, although a lot of people think of uh, RSA suppression as an emotion regulation response, as, as adaptive, it depends entirely on context, and the sad context is one within which normative response is either flat or augmentation of RSA. Girls who showed RSA suppression, which would facilitate a, a increased stress response or fight or flight response, and experienced low levels of supportive maternal socialization uh, had increasing levels of depressive symptoms over the subsequent two years. Um, this was not true for other affects. And in particular, it wasn't true for fearful affect. Girls who showed RSA suppression to the fear video, which would be a normative uh, response of a stressful fight or flight response, had elevated anxiety symptoms over the subsequent two years. So we're getting some emotional specificity going along as well. 
And finally, uh, in research that uh, we've been pursuing through Mitch Princeton's lab here at UNC, um, we looked at uh, the relations between HPA regulation, uh, HPA stress responses to the trio social stress test, and adolescents' suicidality in a sample of girls with elevated levels of clinical and subclinical depression. And not moderated, <laughs> the hyper-responsive HPA stress response, that is this uh, top group here, had five times the level of lifetime suicidal ideation at baseline and 15 times the level of suicidal ideation three months later relative to the normative group. Interestingly enough, the hyper-responsive group didn't show elevated suicidality at baseline, but three months following had four times the rate of the normative group, um, a borderline significant effect there. Although this was not uh, moderated by the social experience of, of peer stress, there was an interaction with impulsivity that impulsivity, oh, one other thing, this was driven by the recovery samples, not by the reactivity samples, by the way. So when we looked at a point-by-point -point analysis, it was primarily these girls who didn't come down from stress reactivity, uh, who, who had the increased suicidality. And it didn't matter how impulsive they were. So whereas impulsivity predicted suicidality for the girls who had normative or hyper-responsive uh, stress reactions, for the girls who had the highly elevated HPA stress response, it um, didn't matter how impulsive they were. But it turns out their social experiences did matter how responsive their HPA access was. Uh, in another study conducted through Mitch's lab uh, in 62 U's, we found that um, we, we brought the girls in, we, haha, -ha, Mitch and his team brought the girls in. I love doing collaborations with people at other universities. Uh, and uh, did the true social stress test, and after the stress induction, invited one of the girl's best friends in to chat with the girl for a few minutes about the speech that the girl just gave, and then the child left again. And what they found was that girls who evaluated the quality of uh, the friendship with that, with that close peer as more highly negative showed a highly persistent stress response to the true social stress test. Uh, they didn't differ in reactivity, they differed in recovery. These girls didn't come down after uh, talking with this, this friend. What do girls tend to do? Uh, I'm saying girls, they were boys in this sample. What do you use, but in particular girls tend to do after stressful things happened? Call, text, or Skype with a friend. That might not always be a good idea. Um, so just to sum up, uh, what I've loved about this meeting so far, and the reason why I'm really looking forward to next year's meeting that uh, Mitch and Eric are gonna continue to put together because this has become my favorite conference, uh, is that uh, we really need to recognize, and this room is showing, that we are start coming to recognize that the neurobiology of depression is embedded in the social lives of adolescents. And you can't really look at one without looking at the other in order to understand both. Uh, so we need more of these integrative models and we need them to start informing our treatments more effectively. Um, so we need to go with now building this, as people have said, into multi-level models where we're integrating these things, taking person-focused analyses to look at the subtypes that are emerging across these different combinations of variables. Um, and that's gonna require more research, more grants, more repeated analyses over longitudinal designs that we somehow have to put into an RDOC framework. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>